Hi everyone, long time no see. For a cool little change of pace this year, I've been attempting a run only a few people can even dream about. The no weapons, no spells run of Baldur's Gate 3. Now, hear me out. When I say no weapons, I mean no using main hand attack, off hand attack, smite, legacy of Avernus, pommel strike, flurry of blows, unarmed strike, rain strike. Wait, wait, wait. So actually, instead of listing every kind of attack roll, let's group them as follows. Attacks using a melee weapon, attacks using a ranged weapon, attacks using my bare fists, and spell attacks. I won't be engaging in any of the above. And as for no spells, obviously nothing. No cantrips, no level 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. I don't want to hear questions. No spells, guys! Now you may be wondering what on earth remains. Throw an improvised weapon strike. The throw command prompts the player to choose either an item from their inventory or from the world. Doing so launches said object a certain distance based on the strength stat of the character throwing. Improvised Weapon Strike is very similar in that pressing it will ask you to choose an object to use as a weapon against the target. The criteria for improvised weapons is much more strict than throwing, but it is capable of dealing some neat damage. Onward from that, we're also still allowed to use potions and grenades of every variety as they're included as a non-weapon, non-magical attack. Enter Mr. Exploder, a 7 foot human barbarian with an appetite for throwing and chucking. He is wicked strong with a matching constitution for that sweet unarmored defense. We wake inside the lithid pod, jumping out and straight into action, wasting almost no time before throwing all these disgusting weapons into the void to evade the temptation of ugh, using them. For my first act of wrestling, I shove Murnath off the chair, knocking him out permanently. I come across another wrestler, Lazel. We team up for the ultimate tag team. This is just in time as a group of imps are alerted to our presence. Given the circumstance and our environment, we attempt to ring out our opponents by throwing them into the chasm. But this is more of a cage match because they reappear right in front of you, so I just settle for throwing them at each other until they die. After Lazel compliments my wrestling ability, we progress further into the Nautiloid to rescue Shadowheart, another would-be wrestler. As a newly formed alliance, we plunge into the bridge of the ship. We are greeted with yet more imps and boars unable to stop our wrestling stampede. We push, shove, throw and smack our way to the console, shifting to the material plane and causing us to fall to our death. After somehow miraculously surviving the crash, we move to rebuild our tag team, finding Shadowheart not too much further down the shoreline. Waking her, we immediately get our hands dirty on some more opponents in the form of little brain guys. This fight took some manipulating to pull off, as these enemies can be really tricky and deal some damage if you get unlucky. Fortunately, there is a pool of fire in the wreckage we can trick one of the enemies into moving next to. We found a couple of goodies on board the ship, one such item being the Nautiloid tank which explodes on contact with fire. Using that, I blow him up. For the other two intellect devourers, I just chain throw them at each other which does a nice amount of damage while Mr. Exploder is raging. As a reward, we get another Nautiloid tank to use in a future fight. We get into a scuffle with the world's most pale man and fail to kick him off the top of us since we can't use Shadowheart's guidance. It's a spell. Finally managing to overpower him, he introduces himself as Asterion and joins our team. I fish Gale of Waterdeep out of a wall, letting him join the party too. I have big plans for him, which you can see in motion here when I pick Transmutation for his School of Wizardry, which allows us to use the passive feature Experimental Alchemy. This gives us a decent chance to create two items when using the Alchemy tab Crafting. More alchemist fires, elixirs of hill giant strength, and greater potions of healing will almost never go astray. We find Lazel and rescue her by using the bow on the ground. Since bows and crossbows do not actually deal any weapon damage when thrown, I'm going to use them strictly as a thrown projectile in this run. They actually turn out to have a pretty desirable quality that I'll discuss later, but just know that I'll never use them to fire arrows, which would void the run. I progress to the grove, where a goblin attack is taking place. Making myself as useful as possible, I move to the high ground and begin launching goblins to their death, which works surprisingly well. 
After some messing about, we take down the goblin threat and retreat inside, making friends with as many people as is possible. Aaron is the trader by the entrance, who carries an amazing item we can't skip out on. It's a ring called the Ring of Flinging, which adds 1d4 of damage to all of our throwing attacks, including the non-weapon kind. Exploding this on Mr. Exploder allows us to stack the bonus damage gained by Barbarian's Rage, so he'll be our prime damage dealer for now. I move Lazel into the party so we're better equipped to fight our way through this crypt. I begin the fight by launching the gnome atop this crate- Oh wait, that's the crate. <laughs> through the crate. This fight gets really messy. We keep getting unlucky with our athletics checks and that causes us to lose many turns. That's okay though, as we're able to hold on thanks to Gale's healing, which he does by launching a potion of healing directly at you, which actually has a decent AoE that lets multiple members heal at once. I make Mr. Exploder climb to the wizard atop the crane, throwing a crate and then proceeding to push her off. After a lot of bad dice rolls, we eventually clear the encounter, ready for the dungeon below. After bursting through the front door, we catch Andorn unawares and take turns beating him to death with my trusty shovel. Mari gets much the same treatment and we're able to bludgeon her to death before she can alert her friends to our presence. I attempt to set up for the fight in the end room by using the nearby oil barrel and the Nautiloid tank I was carrying, but they can't help but bombard Mr. Exploder with firebombs, making him live up to his name and dying. Giving up on the crypt for now, I return to the grove to make inroads for the quest to save the tieflings and restoring order. After talking Karga down and then having Nettie look at us and try to kill us, we resolve to look for Holson in the goblin camp. This gets us the experience we need to promote to level 3, which allows Mr. Exploder to become a berserker, who gets to do an enraged throw as a bonus action while he is raging, which doubles our potential damage output in combat, and it's the ideal build path for the moment. I will also note that they also get to do an improvised weapon strike as a bonus action as well. Returning to the crypt, the occupants have no doubt found their murdered friends and have rearranged themselves in the corridor, taking me by surprise and causing me to reload for a more favourable start. I set up this fight by dragging a candelabra into the hall inflicted with the burning status passively. It is the perfect prop for starting an explosion. So to open, I use a void bulb on Gale and collect my victims in the centre. The Nautilid tank does like no damage, but sets up a pool of fire to use further into the fight. Mr. Exploder chugs a speed potion, launching an oil barrel into the fire to extreme effect. Since only Mr. Exploder was able to promote to a Berserker, everybody else's duty during this fight is to deal chip damage and heal, playing around the speed potioned up Berserker. I beat Torga's head in with the candelabra, switching focus to the archer hidden in the end chamber. Barton dies to a critical shovel attack, freeing us up to delve in and find the real treasure below. I throw a skeleton's corpse for fun and it gets really mad and starts to fight back. I reload, opting instead to disarm the skeletons before angering them. I position my party to target a few key enemies, having Gale activate the button and awakening the undead. Since they're skeletons, it's only natural that they'd be weak to bludgeoning damage. Conveniently, that's precisely what throwing and improvised weapon attacks deal. Unless it's a book, Gale! Stop throwing them! I smash their bones together until they're no longer undead, just dead dead. I head to plunder the newly exposed sarcophagus, only to find a freaky looking skeleton inside. He throws a few riddles at me, but in the end joins my camp as the resident respec expert. I waste almost no time returning to camp and respecing Lazel into a berserker much like Mr. Exploder. 
I hold off on doing the same to Shadowheart for now, as I intend to replace her soon. Gale stays a wizard for his alchemy, but also now has a level in Barbarian, so he can actually contribute a little bit better to the fight. I meet the Dog Scratch, which after consuming an animal speaking potion reveals that he's just like a white guy. Of course he will, and then we'll return home. I'm not really sure what I was expecting, but this, this sucks. I take the long way around the river, finding a woman named Karlak burning by the bank. She asks me to explode all the paladins of Tear chasing her down, which I'll get right back to. First, I have to put all of this trader's goods into a pouch that I sold her. If you haven't seen this before, usually when you kill a trader, they drop one or two good things that they had, but if you put everything that they own into a pouch that you sell them, they drop it all. I don't really want anything in particular she has, but it'd just be nice to have the money, you know? I try a few different ways to assassinate the trader, but she doesn't take enough damage from falling, and she seemingly has some psionic link to her friends, because the moment she hits the ground, they come running. I get to work setting up an elaborate trap for this fight, trapping her on the roof like this, but eventually just have to give up for now as we won't be able to make this work with our current resources and damage output. I get Mr. Exploder a sweet freaking hat. I try to fight the harpies on the beach, but I have way too much trouble getting the saving throw for the lure, so I think I'll just skip out on this one. I make my way over to the Blighted Village, skipping the potential combat to descend into the forge below. Given the low dexterity score of the crew, I break open this chest by launching it off the landing for 10 damage each time, just breaking the sturdy threshold. Stupidly, I walk right out the front door when I was finished there, getting my party wiped so I load a previous save. I mess about for a little while and Karlak manages to get herself stuck in the ground, which is pretty much exactly what I needed. Turns out you can just fast travel out though, so no harm, no foul. I return from the main entrance, which allows us to crash! I return from the main entrance, which allows us to intimidate the goblins into letting us pass. It does help to get advantage on your intimidation checks by your berserker class. On the goblin camp approach, I set up for an assassination on the goblin archer that acts as a lookout. Given his location, it's not hard to launch him directly into the chasm below. He even stops his descent to get really mad at us and then proceeds to die. In an attempt to lure the goblins to this high point, I initiate the fight with Mr. Exploder only. It works a treat, leaving us to beat the wargs down with various objects in our inventories. Dropping heavier objects from this height actually massively increases the damage of the throw, as they're doing an attack roll initially, and then they're getting crushed by the weight of the item afterward. This mechanic is amazing, and will certainly be extremely useful in the fights to come. I will note though, that this works best with items that can't be broken, so a lot of the heavier objects we can use for this, like crates, barrels and the like, will not be able to deal this damage before breaking. That's why I wanted to pick up bows and crossbows. They are heavy, but they do not break on contact. I massacre this group of gobos here by smacking them into each other, much like usual. I wanted to make sure to leave the fire wine as it will be a valuable explosive later. I make my way in and get the brand of the absolute, just in case there are any half decent items we can make use of later with it. It also had some dialogue options for various people, which is always handy. I rescue Volo from his imprisonment, which causes a couple of goblins to come running. I explode the wardrum with a bow to avoid outgrowing the entire den, allowing us to quickly dispatch the goblin pair. Following this, I murder the pair of goblin torturers and release the man using their bodies to break the device. How poetic. I continue inward to set up a collection of explosive materials by the priestess gut. Climbing up the lattice to get a high vantage point and waiting for the NPCs to wander into this formation, where they can all get hit by the resulting explosion. Like before, it's very easy to deal an intense level of damage from this height, which lets us finish the fight very quickly. I proceed to meet Minthara, but not before launching this stinky goblin off the edge. She sees this and moves to attack us, but she does that by standing halfway across a very rinky dinky looking bridge. 
Lazel throws her old Githyanki half plate at the supports and she falls away. All that's left is to throw the scrying orb into the same pit, killing it instantly. Minthara's dear goblin friend Rozak doesn't see any of this happen, so we collectively send him down to be with her. Uh, oh, that's, that's good enough. I go over to the wall to fight the rangers outside the warp pit, getting extremely close to dying without saving after Minthara's fight. I managed to push through and take a long rest, where Lazel actually manages to kill me because I got absolutely cucked on my dice rolls here. Like, look at this man, what the hell? I descend into the warg pit to rescue Holson, having few issues along the way. I also rescue the spiders in the cage outside, which is a mistake because they initiate the fight with the hobgoblin leader guy before I was ready, resulting in this mess here. This is also when I learn that my saves have been corrupted and I need a restart from Holson. What's even more awesome is that the following recording also got corrupted, so I don't have footage of me obliterating this fight, but all you need to know is that Draw Ragslin got pushed down to hole. In this missing recording, I also leveled up to level 4, which grants us access to our first feat. Mr. Exploder, Lazel, and Karlak all pick Tavern Brawler, as it adds their strength modifier twice to the attack roll and damage of all thrown and improvised weapons attacks. Obviously this is really good for us, so I pick it. I give Gale his ration allotment, as he's earned it after all his good work throwing bows and potions. I plunder the grove for all of its ingredients, as all of them will be useful later. Now that we are strengthened through our new passive feature, we try again to defeat the fake Paladins of Tyr, managing to assassinate Sorrel as I had planned to before. This allows us to pick up the pouch I stacked all of her wares into earlier and run off with them. I initiate the fight with the other two on the balcony inside, hopefully forcing them to be tricked into dying in a very similar way. Anders is absolutely overpowered, so we need to do some crazy tricks to kill him. Pushing him off the roof and then dropping various heavy objects works well enough, and you can even see it here when Lazel deals three instances of damage from one single throw. Using a Luck of the Far Realms crit, Anders dives via a Trin missile, who is then sentenced to falling to their death because their use as a weapon has been seen out and is no longer required. After looting their bodies in the vault below, I throw a rotten piece of cheese at Gale to see if it does anything, but all it does is crit him, which just makes me feel bad. After a very lonely night at the tiefling party, I return to work. I go to the blighted village to tie up a few loose ends, launching the goblins off the roof onto each other for some insane damage. I kill the sleeping bugbearer at back and mince for Zerk by passing between my characters. I rescue my man Barkus Root and loot the potion shop across the way. I descend below and steal the necromancy of Thay, never to be used again. I move to strike Auntie Ethel in the gross swamp and attempt to find a way to stop her from retreating from this room up here to avoid the main fight. However, she proves too slippery for my antics, so I just reload and head down there anyways. Following a warning from the hag, I proceed to throw a bunch of garbage at some enthralled would-be adventurers. They may not deserve it, but I couldn't find any other way through. After fumbling my way through the noxious maze below, I make it to the hag fight at the end. I set up my units so that when she splits I have maximum access to each one of them to dispel them as soon as possible, as they're all equally as powerful as Auntie Ethel herself. My opening move is to throw water onto the cage to prevent it from burning, giving me enough time to work through the extreme amount of enemies. Using Alchemist's Fire, I can clear a few of them with Gale who started the fight hidden. The remainder of the clones can be cleared by throwing yet more debris. She splits again, but I follow the same strategy as before. It's important to take out the clones concentrating on hold person, as they significantly limit our damage output. After some rounds, I manage to get Ethel down to low health, refraining from killing her so she can initiate a conversation on her own turn. I intimidate the hag into giving us both the girl and the stat boosting item, which I decide on taking the strength option, as you really can't go wrong with more strength. Lazel then tries to hit on me, but all I care about are explosions and throwing, so I, I turn it down. Yuck. Will tries to have his side plot, but since he's not an active member of the party, I'm pretty uninterested in that. 
Moving on, I run into the gnolls outside the cave, the leader of which I manage to convince into turning on them. Using a few explosives and yet more debris, we finish up the fight and I convince the gnoll to feast on his own self, killing him. I also intimidate the people I saved to give us the loot they were guarding, but I can't open the safe with like lock picking because we don't have any dexterity between us, so I use this cliff to bludgeon it open, giving us the iron flask, an item I have big plans for later. I made plans to lay siege in the goblin camp, as I'd only cleared out the inside initially. My first attempt goes to ruin after aggroing a few too many enemies from a vantage point, so I switch up the strategy and try again from the front gate. Ideally, this allows me to create a bottleneck and I can position various explosives by the entrance to get some easy damage from an otherwise weak loadout. Having all of my berserkers frenzy and carries us through the fight, allowing our throwing attacks to lock down this ogre and leaving only the dregs to pick off one by one. I finish this fight by throwing a goblin bow at this Joe Schmo, but it turns out there's a bug bearing toe. He dies! I finish up by slaughtering the goblins in the foyer, allowing us to loot the vault in the back which I forgot about earlier. I also make sure to pick up these fire wine barrels for some explosive antics later. I travel through and use the ladder to head into the underdark, facing off against a pair of minotaurs after the gate. We use what little terrain advantage we can get and kill them both with health to spare. I make my way over to the Myconid colony and purchase some explosives and meet with the Droga by the shores of the Glimmer Sea. I begin preparing for a fight with them through my usual explosive means. After a few tries setting up many explosives around Gek Kol, I get this set up which one shots him, skipping his raise undead spell which caused me so much hassle in the other attempts. Of course, I also push one of the dwarves off this cliff in secret to make the fight even easier. I'm able to pick up this Droga and this Barbarian is easily pushed to his death off this cliff. I take his boat and head across the Glimmer Sea, when I'm pulled over by the Coast Guard, who I promptly push into the water. I proceed to jump the gap and throw the remaining dwarves into the drink as well. Arriving at the Grimforge, I meet a pair of Druga who hate the true souls as much as I. They agree to help me defeat Nair on the condition that I take out this weird little scrying eye guy. I think to myself that it'd be really easy, but he actually had the nerve to get aggro at me for doing it. After a few different tries, I could not defeat this guy easily. His resistance to damage types is very painful for a setup with only one damage output type like mine. I find this setup where I can push him into the lava by the collapsed tunnel, which works without a hitch. He causes us to hit level 5, granting us access to extra attack which functions as an extra throw slash improvised weapon attack each turn, massively increasing our potential damage output. Now that everything is in place, I break Nier out of the collapsed tunnel using a smoke powder bomb. He emerges and I get my new best friend to attack him alongside me. Using an elixir of hill giant strength, Karlak is able to walk an enemy over to the lava pit and then throw them in. I throw Nier into the lava as well, causing him to slowly melt in the intense heat. I finish this fight by letting my new friend slaughter the last man standing, then I shout him into letting the slaves go free, letting me maintain the moral high ground after assisting some not so savoury people. I meet with Sovereign Spore, as I forgot to when I first travelled through the Myconid colony, and he asks me to bring him the head of Nier. Annoyingly, I have to return to the Grimforge, and then come back, giving us rewards hidden in the vines. I learn of the Adamantide Forge and definitely won't forget about it. I save this wife beater from the Bibberbank field, taking the noble stork for myself. Talking to his wife gives us the gloves of uninhibited Kashigo, which further increases our throne slash improvised weapon damage. I meet Omalum and buy these cool boots off of him, which cause enemies to receive two stacks of reverberation whenever a status is inflicted upon them. Typically, enemies receive prone very often from being thrown or used as a weapon, so it could probably come in useful. I leave the Underdark and head to the mountain pass where we meet the Gift Yankee of the nearby Crash. I decide on heading this way into Act 2, as I haven't done this route yet. I also run into Lady Esther, who wants a Gift Yankee egg really super bad. Instead of indulging her, I sell her a pouch and load it up with all of her wares. Now that everything is in position, I demolish her with my very impressive musculature, 
picking up the pouch afterward. The main takeaway from this loot is the armor piece, the Graceful Cloth. This raises our dexterity by 2 and gives us Cat's Grace, which also gives us advantage on all dexterity checks, which is amazing. Off the back of this great success, I meet with the local kobold population and give them the gift of fire and trash. Given they're easily thrown and used as weapons, this fight goes very smoothly. I take a few of the noisy barrels for use later, as you can never really have too many explosive kobold wines. I smash through this door with a shovel, allowing us to further explore the monastery. I find this puzzle, having already collected the ceremonial mace from the kobolds, the ceremonial battle axe from underneath the guardian of faith, and this ceremonial warhammer from these eagles, who die of a freak falling accident despite their avian disposition. I place them all on their corresponding pedestals, giving us the dawn master's crest. I make it into the Githyanki crest below, talking my way into the infirmary. Lazel wants to climb onto the device that kills you, TM, and unsurprisingly, it tries to kill her, TM. After intervention from the Dream Visitor, we're ambushed by a small army of Gith outside the door. I use my emergency haste spore grenade gifted to us by the Sovereign, allowing us to repeatedly take two actions and turn the tide of the fight. I throw each of them all up and down the room, dealing some ridiculous damage and winning the fight. I meet with the leader of the crash, who would pretty much call BS on all of our attempts to hide the artifact and won't let us pass to meet with the Inquisitor. Forcing my hand, I again litter the arena with various explosive devices and start the fight on my own terms. The Kithrak can cast a fear wave which essentially gives them two turns of free actions and reactions, so I reset until the layout of my units is favourable against this attack. I get this attempt, where I succeed in a stealth check for the explosion, this makes the Kithrak and her dogs become allies with us in the fight against them, but they aggro if you throw too many bombs at them, which I found out. I get really lucky on this attempt, where the Kithrak skips a turn for one reason or another, and I'm able to mop up the remaining enemies easily. I take the rewards I am owed, using the gem I looted to proceed through the magical barrier towards the Inquisitor. I'm not sure what I expected, but the Inquisitor also wants to see the prism we carry. Of course I have to refuse because it's mine and it's very pretty. Naturally, this upsets him and he attacks us, defeating us comfortably before we can ever really do any real damage. When I reload, I instead opt to use the Iron Flask from earlier. I throw it into the arena, summoning a spectator to cause some chaos before we join in on the fight. Before he gets too low, I join the fight and get to work. He turns on my party a little sooner than I would have liked, but I muddle through using as many smoke powder bombs as is possible. I safely dispatch the Inquisitor, and not too long after, the Spectator. Before I can even get the spoils of war, Vlakith appears and makes sure to use some crazy special effects to make all of her dialogue pretty much unwatchable. She commands us to kill the Dream Visitor, which I convince Lazel to refuse. I journey below to find the blood of the Thander, breaking these traps and using the Dawn Master Crest at the end. Now, if you're asking why I did this, I have no intention of using this weapon, but equipping it will let us use the passive on it, which is always nice. I enter the Astral Prism as per Vlaki's request, but not to kill the Dream Visitor, just talk to her. She convinces me to team up with her, much to Lazel's dismay. I resolve to head off back onto the mountain path where I encounter a small horde of undead. I got some use out of the holy water I've been stockpiling, carving through them with my usual corpse throwing strategy. Once defeated, I wander onwards to meet with the wizard Elminster Ormar, a very old man who's besties with Gale. 
We entertain him at camp and we get charged with the duty of nuking the Absolute using Gale's warhead embedded in his chest. But I tell him it would technically count as an attack, so doing so would break the run. On the final night of Act 1, we rest at camp and meet with Kithrak Voss, who attempts to Orpheus pill Lazel and ask for her help in defeating the tyrant god Queen Vlacket. We agree, of course. But that would do it for this episode. Okay guys, I know this is a bit of a different thing and if you've watched all the way through, uh, I really appreciate you. Uh, if you haven't seen this channel before, uh, this is the first Baldur's Gate video I did and I really hope you enjoyed it. Um, I'm just trying out some stuff, uh, you know, just sort of flexing my creative muscle. If you like this video, leave a comment, a like, or even subscribe. I'll be doing more of these. I've already filmed up to like Act 2, so I need to do something with that. Okay, thanks for watching guys. Peace!